Good morning, all. It, uh, my name is Jack Bernard, and I want to welcome you to the 2018 Neubacher Ceremonies. What a wonderful, what a wonderful thing. Yeah. It is really nice to see so many people here. Um, it, it is, uh, I can remember coming to these ceremonies when it really was a smattering of people, and now there is a sea of interesting people, and it's been fun to be here over the last half hour engaging with all kinds of people. We have a very uh, full agenda today, so I, I, uh, I'm, I'm gonna move quickly into that agenda. I wanna start by um, uh, bringing up to the podium somebody who uh, has served the University of Michigan um, in, in a, a, a critical role as, a, as regent uh, for 24 years. Uh, Andrea Fisher Newman has dedicated uh, her time and energy to supporting the University of Michigan. Um, in particular, we are fortunate because uh, Andy, along with many of our other regents, have taken a real interest in, div uh, in diversity and, and with respect to that diversity, in particular to disability uh, and access for people on our campus. We are really fortunate that our regents actually think these issues are important. Uh, for those of you who've been coming year after year, you will notice that we, we have the presence of regents at our, at our little event here every year uh, for the last decade or so. And we are really, really fortunate to have outstanding uh, public servants like Andrea Fisher Newman. And would you please come up to the podium and help us commence our ceremony? Um, thanks, Jack, for your very, very kind introduction. And I want to introduce two other people in the audience who are parents of one of my colleagues, Bob and Sandy White. I know that um, Kathy's been here. My colleague Kathy White's been here on other occasions, is not here with us today, but her parents are here as great representatives also of the Board of Regents and supporting the university. On behalf of the Board of Regents, I am honored to join you for this wonderful and inspiring ceremony. I, um, I have been trying to get to the Neubacher Award for years. Um, I had a sister that was disabled. And um, th these are, what the university does here is so important, and to the Neubacher family, so important for having set this up and perpetuating it and focusing us on it. The board really does care about these issues. When we hear of something, we want to fix it immediately. Um, Loretta Thomas, who's here, just told me that the last building that was um, difficult to maneuver in has finally been at least torn down and a new one's been brought up, but now I'm hearing there may be some other concerns for other types of disabilities on certain buildings. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that over time the university will be the single most welcoming place in the country for disabled individuals, uh, for people that need extra help. I also want to thank the members of the Council for Disability Concerns and the many others on campus who work to make the university a welcoming place for all. Ceremonies like this are extremely important. They shine a light on our efforts to create an environment that allows full access to programs, services, and facilities for students, faculty, staff, and guests. Dr. Okalami, I hope I got that right, uh, Assistant Professor of Family Medicine Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation speaks of disabusing disability. And I hadn't heard that until recently, and I love that term, disabusing disability, which he describes as hoping to demonstrate that being disabled does not mean that one is unable. And that's what we're here to see today. It's amazing, everybody is able, everybody participates and everybody is equal to everybody else. And that's, that, that's, that's the purpose and that, that's why we're here. We need to continue to make sure we educate our students and others about the concerns of those with disabilities and instill confidence in all, no matter the challenges, that they can use their talents to make the world a better place. Today's recipients are truly notable for their leadership and support of people with disabilities. They have greatly enriched our university and our community. And congratulations to each of you. You inspire 
You inspire me, you inspire us, you inspire all of us with your commitment and accomplishments. You've expanded our awareness of the potential inherent in all people and have made our community a better place. We look forward to your continuing success and most importantly, to your impact on the world. We're grateful for your dedication and inspiration you provide across our community. Thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you for honoring those we're honoring today and those that we'll honor in the future and those that we've honored in the past. Go Blue. <laughs>
He's had multiple surgeries. He is still active in the therapeutic sports events. He does horseback riding, adaptive skiing, hockey, basketball, and golf. He also said he spends lots of time with his orthopedic surgeon. He does want to become a physical therapist or a nurse, and he wants to ha help each other. The second recipient of the Saul and Shirley letterer is Mabel Chan. Mabel, if you could join me, please. <laughs> Mabel is a sophomore in computer science. She also has had multiple surgeries as a youth. She worked as an inventory control specialist for a corporate company called Anya Gyms. But she used her computer skills in computer science to work on a system to make their company better in supply and demand and ordering their supplies. She is um, one of the $1,000 winners for Saul and Shirley Letterer. Now I am going to have her stand up here and stay up here because she's also the winner of the Wesley Smith Award. As you can see, Mabel has a can-do attitude. She believes that long hours of working on a problem are still worth it in the end. In high school, she was top of her class for math, science, and basketball. She likes to turn her ideas into execution. Congratulations, Mabel, on winning both of these awards. She also has to get to class. <laughs> <laughs> the other a winner of the Wesley Smith Award is in clinic today. He is Michael Koroleski. He is a student from Delaware. He does try to exist in between the deaf and hard of hearing students and both communities. He doesn't allow his disability to define him. He volunteers at Kids Give a Smile that allowed him to work with underserved youth in working on their oral health. He is in many clubs and many organizations here on campus, and I'm gonna list a few of them. I couldn't list all of them because I would have run out of pages. American Dental Hygiene Association. He's the student vice president. He's the American Sign Language co-president this year for the last two years. And he also is involved in linguistics research here on campus. So he is in clinic today and he, um, is one of the winners of the $500 from Wesley Smith. I'm going to introduce my boss, Stuart Siegel. He is our Director of Services with Students with Disabilities. He is here to present the um, inaugural Adam Miller Memorial Fund Award for faculty and staff. Good morning. I thought I was going to present the award, but instead I'm actually going to have a member of uh, SSD Student Advisory Board give the award. And I just want to say a word before I turn it over to him and introduce him. Uh, this award came about because uh, for actually two years now, the Student Advisory Board has as a project wanted to sort of recognize a faculty and staff member who has gone above and beyond sort of the spirit and the the letter of the law. And we have never had a ward recognizing staff and faculty given by the office, and we wanted to do this. Before I introduce Jeff, um, I also want to say one thing. Because of the timing of all this, we are actually planning on doing a very nice plaque. We didn't have time to do the plaque, so we do have sort of a nice frame thing, and I want to assure each of the winners that they will be getting a plaque very shortly. That's very nice. So without further ado, I want to introduce Jeff Edelstein, who is part of our Student Advisory Board. And Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Hi. Uh, so I'm joined here by Vicki, who's also on the SSD Student Advisory Board this year. Um, we're both very excited to be part of this inaugural award. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about this kind of award, recognizing folks who are particularly strong advocates in the faculty and staff realm around campus, uh, akin to the, in some ways, the Golden Apple Award. 
Um, so uh, I'll start off with mine. So I'm actually uh, recognizing our, a, our staff recipient of the Adam Miller Memorial Faculty and Staff Appreciation Award. Um, and I'll say that this person um, has so much energy. Um, I've met, I've only been here at Michigan for about a year. Um, a little over that time, but in that time I've met so many members of this wonderful community that we have in support of disability culture, disability awareness, and all sorts of aspects of the community uh, from every single part of this campus and beyond. Um, and this person's work often might not be recognized, um, and it's be partially because it's not in maybe the area that folks ex expect. A lot of folks will think of the of think of the academic units or think of the SSD or think of even uh, the libraries as where they go for their supports um, and for advocacy. But this person uh, looks beyond the looks beyond where the student is right now. Not that the other units don't, but they especially have their eye to the future, um, looking to where students will go, where they will end up, and where they will continue to make. Michigan proud. Um, so this person did so much, uh, has done so much in their time here thus far, and I'm excited to see what they continue to do, and are a active and so, again, so much energy and excitement around supporting students on our campus with disabilities. Um, and it gives me so, so much pleasure to present the staff award to Joel Fondaro uh, from the Career Services. Dr. Sarah Saunderson is a faculty recipient of the award. She has contributed to the life of a student with dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD, along with mental health issues. She continues to tackle the mission of the SSD office while supporting the university's commitment to equity and um, diversity, providing exceptional support services to students with disabilities. Dr. Sarah Saunderson can, continues to make a difference in my life as a student with a disability through her direct and continuous motivation. As a student assigned to the Alumni, um, Camp Michigan, Alumni Association's Camp Michigania pro project, I was present as Professor Saunderson shared the importance of diversity throughout each group. Um, I'm so sorry. Deliberate in her explanation of diversity, she demonstrated that winning team environments intentionally draw on every member's skill. She encouraged creativity within, and while disregarding the negative perceptions of my group, made me feel relevant, creating a learning environment that allowed me to succeed and grow. At this time, I'd like to call up Dr. Saunderson, please. So I don't know what's next. I just got here. I hope everybody's having a great time. Now, so. Thanks, Jeff. Good morning. I'm Stephanie Rosen, and I'm here representing the Council for Disability Concerns, of which I am the re very relatively new chair. Um, and mostly what I'll be doing while I'm up here is just expressions of gratitude. So first of all, I want to thank Anna Akoli Schnitzer and the entire Neubacher Award Committee for putting on this entire event. From reading award applications to the logistics of this morning, thank you so much for bringing us here and making this possible. Uh, I also want to thank the staff here at Rackham um, for hosting us this morning and also for giving us a home for our monthly meetings for the Council for Disability Concerns. So special shout outs to Latasha Mitchell and Dennis Williams for that. And also um, Assistant Dean Ethereum Brammer, who works here in Rackham and has been a really powerful ally and advocate. 
thinking about disability as it affects the experience of graduate students at U of M and how we can work together to better serve graduate students with disabilities. I also want to thank my colleagues at the University of Michigan Press for being here in a table towards the food, if you haven't seen them yet. <laughs> so they're offering several books, including Diversity Includes Disability, Perspectives on the U of M Council for Disability Concerns. So this is a relatively new book that tells the 35-year history of the council, what this group has done at the university, the changes it has made. And this book is by my beloved colleagues, Anna Schnitzer and Bonnie Deedee. So I encourage you to please check it out. It's available for sale or for browsing. And the press is also offering several classics from disability studies that are published by our own press. And <clears throat> a few more. I want to thank Jack Bernard, the longtime chair of the Council for Disability Concerns. I think it was the last 18 years-ish, yeah. <clears throat> Um, for entrusting me with facilitating and leading the council forward now that he has stepped down as active chair. So Jack is really responsible for leading the council to its current place of importance on the campus, while he has also been doing advocacy for access in the realm of the law and his teaching and <clears throat> among university leaders. And of course, I want to thank the Council for Disability Concerns, the group of advocates who um, meet monthly, who put on this program and the entire month of programs for investing in ability. <clears throat> so I only recently became chair of the council. And it has been a process of kind of keeping us on track and now beginning to see where that track may lead us by taking feedback from today's active members. So, I hope to have more to report on what that looks like a year from now, two years, 18 years, who knows. Um, but thank you to you, everyone who's here today, members of the community, U of M staff, students, faculty, and leadership for recognizing the importance of the work that's being celebrated today and being here to celebrate it. So I firmly believe that putting disability concerns at the center of our thinking can be really transformative um, in our own values and the way that we interact with each other and move through the world. And also for the institution, I see this all the time in the library, which is where I work at the university, and in all the areas where my most fierce colleagues, advocates work as well. Of course, we see that in the work of our award recipient today. So I'm going to turn it over to Jack to have a chance to speak before we move into our Neubacher Award presentation. Thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, I've gotten to the stage in life where when people say long time, I translate that as to old. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it, we, the council is really fortunate to have uh, Stephanie chair, chairing it uh, these days. Um, it's a, transitions are a wonderful thing. Uh, they're an important thing. Um, as Stephanie said, I chaired the council for sometime between 17 and 18 years, and it, it really it was a thrill for me um, to, to be able to do that, to serve the community, to be a part of this constituency, and I, uh, I, I was moved every day that I did it. But I also felt like it was important not to, to uh, be without some change. I, you know, I, I have my ways. When you do something for a long time, you have your way of, of doing it. So uh, last year, after, shortly after the uh, Neubacher ceremony, I, I passed the torch on to Stephanie, um, and now I have not gone to a meeting for a while because I, I have a rather large personality and thought it was better to let the new chair uh, formulate her, her own trajectory, which I think is, uh, which is already you know, bearing fruit. Um, and, and very important to do. But, but be warned, I'm starting to come back to meetings in January. So, um, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm excited about uh, your leadership and the work of the council. And it, it, it really is wonderful for me to have the opportunity to, um, to say a few words. And it's kind of, of Anna to ask me to do that. 
usually when I, I come up here, I talk about things that I've been thinking about. And I have a couple of things I've been thinking about, and I'm going to try to keep my comments really short today. The, the first thing is, I was shocked, just shocked, at the vacuum in my life after I stepped down as chair. I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I really had no idea that it had become such a deep part of my identity to be doing this work in a very formal way. It's not that I've stopped doing disability work altogether. I still have many places where I'm, I'm active, but I didn't realize it. And I love that. I love being surprised at myself um, and having to deal with w w what I do with this vacuum. Well, okay, I'm gonna go back to the council and engage around it, but it, it's a reminder to me that we all have opportunities to have these kinds of engagements with things that are larger than ourselves. Uh, it, 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 it's worth our time and energy to be interacting with people around a variety of issues. Uh, whatever issues are that motivate you, pick something and, and get out there and do it. Um, uh, you, you often don't realize what you have until you've, you've stepped away from it. Um, and I definitely found this to be a, a part of my, uh, my own experience. Um, it, was, it was actually <laughs> much more traumatic for me than I, than I realized, but I, I, it also gives me the opportunity to reflect on this idea that when we invest ourselves in people and uh, activities, efforts, that we, uh, we have the opportunity to, to uh, enable um, both profound change in the world and, and change in ourselves. So that was the first thing I've been thinking a lot about lately. The, the second thing is, and I, I will keep this short, uh, is this idea of the narrative and how, how much we are drawn in to whatever the particular zeitgeist is of the day, we, we are pulled into it. There are narratives that appeal to us. There are narratives that motivate change. Um, but even, uh, even in the face of facts, the narrative can, um, can occlude those facts because we just become accustomed to hearing information in, in a particular way. Sometimes that's you know, not a bad thing, but sometimes it, it might mean that we aren't paying attention to something. Um, let me, let me give you an example. The, the Ruderman Family Foundation uh, completed a study earlier this year, a very, a very substantial study. It, it's interesting, uh, people with disabilities make up uh, somewhere between 12 and 13, 14, 13 percent of the population. Usually the numbers are somewhere in the 12 range. At least th those are the sort of official numbers in the United States. They make up almost 50%, almost 50%, just shy of 50% of the police shootings, deaths at the hands of a, a police officer. And I'm not here to get political or to say anything bad about the police. I, that, that's not my focus. But that's not the narrative, right? The, that isn't what we're talking about um, when, we, when we're thinking about police shootings. And actually, we have very serious things to think about along those lines. But it, it isn't what people are talking about, uh, because there are other powerful, important narratives out there, narratives we should care about. Um, but, it, but it does sometimes mean that the really salient facts get occluded. Um, and I think this is a call to us. It's a reminder, at least to me, to be thinking how, about how important it is to, to have your hands on the reins of the narrative to engage around a narrative that appeals to people, to get people to take interest. Um, it, it's, it's critical that we, when we're doing our disability work, that we shape a narrative that people can relate to and understand. Because there's already a narrative out there about people who have disabilities, and it's, it's not a charitable narrative. It's not an inviting or welcoming narrative. Um, it's a narrative sometimes of sympathy and pity, um, uh, the larger narrative. It's a narrative of maybe being able to catch something that somebody has, or maybe the narrative that s this person might not be able to do what you would expect this person to do because of some limitation. Those are very powerful narratives in our society. And it, it is up to us, those of us in this room and the people we know, 
to grab the narrative and reshape it. And we reshape it by getting out there and having people engage around the subject matter. People are uncomfortable talking about disability right now. It's hard. I mean, we even at, on the council, I noticed uh, some of the discussion on the council. There's, there are potentially divides about how you describe a person who has a disability. Um, uh, there are a variety of ways to talk about people. Me, I always think, I just want people talking about disability. Um, you, you can call me whatever name you like, and some of you may have some very choice names for me. Uh, but, I, but I want people engaging around disability. And I think this is an opportunity uh, for us, a reminder. It's certainly been a reminder for me to be thinking about how we, how we shape the narrative. So those are my thoughts for this year. We'll see what comes out next year. Um, uh, two things, uh, uh, two more things I have to do up here. Uh, the first is, uh, she doesn't like me to do this, so it always seems like an invitation to do this. I want to just acknowledge Sue Deer Hall, who is doing our CART transcription. Um, we really... <laughs> We really appreciate it, and I apologize from, for being from New York and speaking so quickly. Uh, <laughs> so the second thing I get to do here is I get to introduce uh, the heart of the Council for Disability Concerns, the person who really continues to keep the organization going, the chair. When I was the chair, I was the mouth of the council. We now have a chair who can be the brains of the council. Um, but uh, the real heart of the council is our own Anna Erkley Schnitzer. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jeremy, for carrying those heavy frames over there. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm happy that you're all here, because I think this is the happiest ceremony. Maybe graduation also equals the happiness on this campus. So. I would also like to acknowledge the Neubachers, daughter Margaret, grandson Will. Welcome. We love having you here. Another item I'd like to bring to your attention is that we have an early recipient of the Neubacher Award, Dr. John Hagen, in our audience. And we also have a former University of Michigan regent, Julia Darlow. And I'm so glad you're here. Julia was, was one of our early advocates. And she really helped a lot. I would never forget the assist that you gave us, the boost that you gave us in our journey toward some progress with disability issues. OK, now, my name is Anna, as you know. And I am a huge fan of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Huge, because I think that I had the sentiments of diversity, equity, and inclusion since I was five and a half years old. And that was a long time ago. And I didn't know the words for them, maybe, but I had the feelings. So now that we have the initiative, President Schlissel, we have Robert Sellers here, I just feel as though this is perfect, perfect. I'm just in my glory. I'm so happy. So back to the word happy, happy, happy. Um, <clears throat> another thing that we talk about in the library, and Stephanie Rosen, the, chair, the new chair of our council, is the guru in this, is accessibility. So accessibility is also very important. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, because accessibility makes possible a lot more inclusion, as we know. In our audience, we have a number of accessibility, disability champions, and I will give a brief narrative of each one and why he or she or they has won the uh, Certificate of Appreciation, of which we have many. And uh, to get started, 
I'd like to talk about the Brad Nav Project. So this is a team of students from an engineering course taught incidentally by our Neubacher Award recipient, Dr. David Chesney, who work on a project every semester. And the project that we are acknowledging today is the Brad Nav. So we have on the team of students who worked on this project, in addition to Bradley Ebenho, we have Anand Akash, Julia Cullen, Jason Pinho, Liam Wiesenberger, and of course, Dr. Chesney. So I do have some certificates. Now two of the members of this team have been, um, have found jobs elsewhere out of state. <laughs> And so they, they wrote that they couldn't be here, so I'm going to send them their certificates. But uh, if you would come to the front area, the people who are here from this team, we can give you the uh, certificates. So what the team did, I should get back here with it. <laughs> what the team did was facilitate navigation for Brad across campus. And what the team has achieved, I think, is very helpful. Is that correct, Brad? Yeah. So this one, yeah, this one is for you. But you can pick it up later, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, Anna, Leanne, anybody else here from the Brad Nav team? Well, we have our foremost representative. <laughs> Our next recipient, who we would like to recognize, is Christopher Connolly. And uh, it's OK, I can walk back, or, or Jeremy can help me walk back with the certificate. Chris is a motivated and energized and engaged medical student working to break down barriers and improve accessibility at the U of M Medical School. He's a leader in instituting change that includes individuals with disabilities being accepted into medical school and therefore have different levels of mobility involved. Although there are still areas where obstacles are encountered in the environment, Chris is helping to identify those areas and developing innovative solutions to overcome them. For example, it's difficult to complete an exam using a cardiology stethoscope if a student has limited hand dexterity. And Chris sought out an engineer from the U of M Rehab <coughs> Engineering Program. Together, they designed and prototyped a device that allows students to properly handle and use this instrument. Chris also proactively reached out to the Office of Technology Transfer to help in protecting and commercializing this invention so others in the future can use it. He plans to make it available to medical students and physicians globally by a downloadable file that can be sent to a 3D printer for rapid fabrication. We thank you for your work, Chris, and we know that you're going to continue doing it. The next recognition is to Jeffrey Edelstein, whom you've already met. He was here a few minutes ago. And since matriculating as a graduate student in the School of Education, he's taken the U of M disability world by storm. I think you got a little bit of a taste of that. Um, he's the co-founder of the College Autism Network at Florida. He was the co-founder at Florida State. And in less than a year, he has provided valuable support to our campus in many ways including being an exceedingly helpful member of the Council for Disability Concerns, promoting many events, working on proposals to help advance the disability community in many ways. And he's currently moving forward with the original vision by Roy, Lloyd Shelton of a non-academic space where students with disabilities can socialize and compare notes. Uh, I personally have found that if there's an area of disability where we need a hand, this gentleman will give us that hand. He is a man of action. For his creativity, 
goodwill, enthusiasm, and great future potential, the council would like to acknowledge Chris with this beautiful certificate of appreciation. The next certificate of appreciation recipient is Daniel Elman. And Daniel has been instrumental in the development of the new wheelchair basketball game at my children's hospital. He gives his time, expertise, and love of the sport. And he is a wheelchair user who enjoys life and wants to teach children that they can do anything in a wheelchair that other children can do, only they do it a little differently. And we have seen you and your team at Chrysler at the Army-Navy wheelchair game. And that's a lovely video. I watch it over and over. The children are so cute. They never make the basket, but they're so happy. <laughs> they did. <laughs> they love the applause, too. Thank you so much. Now, as you see, and I really love this part, that there is a broad spectrum of people who have been recognized. In other words, faculty, staff, students, alumni, anyone can be recognized, anyone in the, affiliated with the University of Michigan. And there are lots more champions out there. So when the nominations for um, the Neubacher appear, nominate other people. There are lots of people out there doing this work. That's just a little plug here. <laughs> Okay, now we have um, three physicians from Michigan Medicine, Dr. Stephen Gay, Dr. Rajesh Mangrolkar, we know him as Raj, and Dr. Philip Zazov, please come to the front, Dr. Gay, yes. <laughs> Now I'd like to explain, could I just shake your hand sir, again? Thank you. I'd like to explain that this, that this is a huge achievement. Uh, this is something that is going to, I think, echo internationally. And what it is, is allowing, permitting, enabling medical students who happen to have disabilities to be part of our medical school. And I've been here for a long time, and this has never been the case, and it's wonderful that you have achieved this by teamwork and going to the AMC, American Academy of Medical Colleges, and changing things for the better for people with disabilities so that physicians who have disabilities can better understand the patients with disabilities, can reflect the population. Did you want to say anything? Did you want to have anything to add? Sure. Sure. <laughs> uh, we're all hum humbled and honored. Uh, for us, I'll be honest, it was about us being selfish. We wanted to assure that we as a, as a field and as the University of Michigan Medical School specifically always matriculated the very best medical students in the country. And we realized that in order to do that, we had to change the way we thought about being physicians and understand that it is an intellectual exercise at its very core. And thus, we needed to make sure that we were open and engaging for anyone of acceptable intellect. Anyone can be a, a great physician. And so thank you. Thank you so much. Our next honoree is Shana Katari. And Shana, uh, as her nominator wrote, Shana is an emerging leader in the field of disability research. Her innovative dissertation developed and validated the first scale to measure microaggressions and demonstrated the significant impact these actions have on the mental health of disabled people member of the School of Social Work faculty, Shauna's growing body of publications examines how disability interacts with identities such as sexual orientation, gender identity, age, and race. And in addition to her empirical and theoretical work, Shauna reveals her commitment to disability issues by conducting training 
and education around this topic to community and government organizations working for social justice and building bridges for diversity, equity, and inclusion by engaging in authentic dialogue about ableism to challenge the problematic narratives that reinforce bias and stigma of disabled persons. Thank you so much, Shana. Okay, on a personal note, I heard Shana on a panel recently in connection with our investing in ability. You've all seen the brochure, colorful, beautiful brochure done by Matt and Michelle of uh, HR Communications. And Shana was outstanding. I didn't think I would enjoy that panel, but I really came away a convert to everything that was said. I learned a lot. Okay, our next team, this is a team, consists of David Lorch and Maureen Molly Fatson. And they, uh, for the past year and a half, David, who's a researcher in biomedical engineering, and Molly, who's a third year medical student, have been working together to design a device to assist Molly and future students with limitations in their mobility to complete high quality physical examinations on patients. As we can understand, patients with physical differences are often able to provide a unique understanding and empathetic care to patients. Uh, physicians with physical differences can provide empathetic care to patients, highlighting the importance and need for a more diverse population of healthcare providers and increased open access to facilitating their practice. David and Molly's teamwork is helping to increase accessibility in the medical field by removing barriers to physicians and physicians-to-be. To this end, and as part of the Third Century Initiative, the Council would like to acknowledge David and Molly, team of David and Molly, with these certificates of appreciation. Our next recipient, Clarissa Love. Are you here, Clarissa? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> As an integral member of the Office for Health Equity and Inclusion, Clarissa continually demonstrates a commitment to the concept that all people, regardless of the nature or degree of their disability, my <laughs> friend. <laughs> She's very huggable. Yeah, I hug her all the time have the right and obligation to become full and contributing members of Michigan Medicine. She co-chairs the Disability Resource Group and has been an important leader in promoting the acceptance and awareness of people with disabilities in all aspects of her work. Her enthusiasm for diversity and inclusion and her positive approach to problem solving make her a leader, but she leads with humility and friendliness drawing out the best efforts of each team and making every individual feel valued. For her exuberant leadership in the area of disability, we are proud to recognize Clarissa with this certificate. <laughs> Gina Marino, please. Gina is a 16-month student pursuing a master's of social work. She's studying the interpersonal practice in mental health and management of human services. She has been instrumental in leading her peers to identify challenges and find solutions. Recently presented details on the specific needs of individuals in urban communities living with a severe and persistent mental illness by introducing best practice methods. She emphasized a personal and strength-based perspective to service delivery. And Gina was a crucial member to developing the We're People Too, a student-led and facilitated organization dedicated to making space for and encouraging students living with a mental illness. Out of the Shadows was an open forum inviting students to share their stories of resilience. And she's worked with the Community Reentry Program teaching independent living skills to adults with severe and persistent mental illnesses. 
Gina always hopes to create change and build a sense of community, and she's a proponent of integrated health care with a passion for mental health. Thank you for all you do, Gina. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Joseph Myers. If he's not here, I'll just read a little narrative. <clears throat> As part of the University Health Service, Dr. Myers provides eye care to many, many members of our own community. However, outside his official job, he has spent most of the last 20 years as the co-founder and leader of the Eye Health Institute, serving Jamaican residents who have no additional vision resources. So he took a trip to Jamaica with two optometrists in 1996 and was deeply impacted by the number of people waiting in the heat and humidity to be seen by these doctors and fitted with eyeglasses. So after that, they instituted, he and some uh, team members instituted the Eye Health Institute with the simple practice of supplying glasses. People can get back to their work, churchgoers can read their Bibles, and uh, they can pursue an active life. So we honor Dr. Joseph Myers, OD, Doctor of Optometry with a certificate, which I will send him. <laughs> Our next recipient is Stephanie Rosen, whom you've already met. Stephanie. <laughs> the chair of the council for the past year. But before that, we knew about Stephanie. Stephanie, your name is bandied about in a very positive way because she is the one to provide accessibility services. Um, she is the one to provide uh, instruction on inclusive classrooms to the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching. And she has instituted a new walk-in program housed in the library to assist with anyone who has accessibility issues. She has arranged conferences on a multitude of topics relevant to accessibility and has been a contributor to all aspects of accessibility. We thank you, Stephanie, and we certainly can't leave you. <laughs> So this is a team award to Pamela St. John and the UM cheer team. And every year, the Council for Disability Concerns, under the leadership of our good friend Gerald Hoff, organizes and sponsors an Army-Navy wheelchair basketball game. And lately, they've been held, over the past few years, it's been held at Chrysler. Goal is to make a festive, free, fun event for everybody, children, adults, people with and without disabilities, as well as veterans. And over many years, Pamela and the UM Cheer Team have supported the wheelchair games. And by doing so, they bring joy, not just to our veterans, but also to the many children who attend the games. They make it more fun, even more fun than the game already is. They always give the children special attention, something that means so much to them, for their peppiness and the added spark. The U of M cheer team has provided to our annual game, and we want to recognize this dynamic group for this. We have another, we have another team award to you, Mays which is an adaptive sports program conceived and staffed by volunteers within the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Its goal is to enhance physical, social, and emotional development of people with disabilities by providing quality, local, low-cost sports and recreation opportunities throughout the lifespan. So this consists of um, rehabilitation engineer Shang Hee Yoon, Jamie Mayo, and recreational therapist Becky McVeigh and Megan Viega. So congratulations. <laughs> well, we've come to the end of the alphabet, and <laughs> Alice Young, Allie, Alice Young. Last but not least, not at all. Okay, let me give you a little explanation. Allie is the dining hall assistant manager at Oxford. 
She hired the first cook in the unit who happens to be completely deaf and does not read lips. So Allie took classes to learn American Sign Language with the goal of communicating with this new employee to provide a successful job experience. Allie and her staff helped translate Culinary Foundations One, which is a, a required class for all culinary employees, into American Sign Language. And she's also in the process of having a translator brought in to have the employee become Serve Safe certified. Serve Safe certified. All this is required by the Michigan Health Department. She partnered with the Michigan Dining Training Specialist and Support Team to film and closed caption all required training, such as allergen training. By removing barriers, working with the employee to modify classes, she allowed the opportunity for advancement with the department, and even more importantly, she encouraged acceptance to her staff, demonstrating that potential employees with disabilities can succeed at the job, enabling future job candidates and increased likelihood of job offers and finding employment. For her exemplary work in promoting inclusion, we recognize Allie Young with the certificate. <laughs> And I think that's all the stories I have today. But don't forget, nominate other people. There'll be more stories. Nice. Anna, you are a superstar. Um, yeah, we're clearly, uh, as Roy Scheider said in Jaws, going to need a bigger boat because some of our recipients couldn't even make it up here because we're so packed in here, which is not good for the Council for Disability Concerns. So. <laughs> Uh, but th thank you, Anna. You, um, you just got to hear uh, tales of, of people's personal and professional contributions. And, and it, it, it is worth thinking that all of the people you've heard about, they contribute to the positive narrative I was talking about. But they also affect the lives of individuals, people. People nominated each one of those people you've heard from today. And actually, all of the people who've been up here speaking with you uh, today, even introducing people, have been people who've been deeply invested. And it, it is really why this is the, the best event of the year for, for so many of us. Uh, now we are coming to the, to the featured moment here where we're going to uh, move into the Neubacher part of the Neubacher ceremony. It is, it is a thrill, again, to have the Neubachers here. And um, I see Jim Neubacher looking at me here. And he just reminded me about you know how young I was when we first met. <laughs> you know, only one of us has aged. Uh, you look the same. Me, it's not pretty. Um, so right now, I'm I'm going to turn the podium uh, over to the the person who's going to introduce uh, our Newbacher Award recipient. But I want to just take a, a short moment to acknowledge uh, Dr. Robert Sellers. Um, who is our Vice Provost for Equity and Inclusion and the University's Chief Diversity Officer. Um, and you know, while I have him sitting here, I'll just point out um, uh, in the spirit of the, the current chair who emphasizes accessibility, you know, D-E-N-I, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which is, which is a huge commitment on the part of the university. If you just adjust those letters and stick an A for accessibility, you get idea. Um, and so I, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> so it's just worth considering that now that I have you as a captive audience. Um, so I do want to take um, a moment to just acknowledge how fortunate we are to have someone like Rob Sellers uh, as our chief diversity officer. Uh, we, it, it is very easy uh, when you are in, in this kind of a position to be overwhelmed by the amount of need and attention that the community demands. We have lots of constituencies at the university um, who want to feel welcomed, who want to have an equitable experience, who want to be included. Uh, and it is, uh, it, it is demanding to, to be the recipient of all of that uh, attention. 
we really appreciate those of us who do disability work and particularly those of us on the council, how much of a commitment you have made uh, from the beginning, from the moment that you, you took that office to including uh, disability uh, as, as part of the diversity initiatives here. I can tell you I've, I've come to Rob several times to ask for assistance and every time he has moved towards me, he, he offered more than I came asking for. Um, which is fantastic, and it's the first time in, in all the years uh, at, that I've had at the university that somebody went the extra mile and, and made it better than, than what I had even asked for. And so we are so fortunate, and I hope you will help me welcome Rob Sellers to the podium. Uh, first, uh, before I... Uh move us to the um, uh, most honored uh, part of our ceremony. I, I did want to also take an opportunity to acknowledge Chris Conley, who did not have an opportunity to move up front, but I do want to make sure that uh, uh, we all got a chance to uh, recognize Chris and for his outstanding work, and thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the council and thank Stephanie and thank Jack and uh, definitely thank Anna for this uh, really uh, wonderful uh, opportunity to participate in uh, today's program. Anna had mentioned at the beginning that uh, she has uh, been a fan of uh, DEI and what the university has done. Uh, I can tell you personally, I am a fan of Anna uh, um, and the council as well, but uh, just know that uh, in many ways, much of the efforts that we have attempted to do uh, in the context of the university's diversity, equity, and inclusion plan have been uh, inspired by uh, the work uh, that has been done uh, historically on this campus on behalf of uh, the disability community. In many ways, uh, when we think about DEI, oftentimes uh, people want to think about it in the context of individuals who have historically not had uh, access, opportunity uh, uh, for inclusion at this university. And much of the effort uh, often gets confused in the notion that the goal is to somehow uh, uh, provide uh, assistance and access and opportunity uh, out of altruism, out of, oh, it's the morally right thing to do. We feel good about helping uh, these individuals who've not had the, the uh, uh, same uh, opportunities as we had. And while I do believe the world needs more altruism, that isn't it. It's actually a much, the, the work that has been done in this area is very different. It's really recognizing that we all benefit and comes from a place of valuing the perspectives, the experiences, the uh, intellect that can be brought to bear when everybody has an opportunity for this educational experience here at the University of Michigan. And so in many ways, when I think about what we're attempting to do with regards to uh, the DEI, make no mistake about it, we want to improve access and opportunity for those who have not uh, had that access and opportunity. But I believe we must do it if the university is going to live up to its challenge of being leaders and best. Because those individuals who've not had that access and that opportunity, we who have need them more than they need us. So in that spirit, it is my great pleasure um, uh, to be able to introduce today's uh, recipient of the um, James T. Neubacher Award. In Dr. David Chesney, he's been a go-to individual on our campus for several years. His name has been well known around campus as the instructor who offers 
engineering and computer science courses that enable students to help children with disabilities in concrete, life-affirming ways. He chooses a child with a specific cognitive or physical disability and working with his undergraduate students at the beginning of their academic experience and again at the end of their U of M uh, uh, college career, he engages the students for an entire semester with finding ways to make life more enjoyable and actually more easily livable for that child. Medical professionals, typically from the C.S. Mott Children's Hospital, are invited into the course to discuss the particular disability. Sometimes a family member with a personal experience with a disability becomes involved and is integral to the class, thereby providing a human face and a human experience to the work that is being done. Each student proposes some app or game to help these individuals who are differentially or differently abled. Then groups of students form around the very strongest ideas. Students work to design, build, and test the apps during the semester. If the idea has wings or wheels at the end of the semester, then the amazing resources that we have here at the University of Michigan often help to turn these ideas, these software ideas, into actual commercial products. Leading companies like Microsoft, Intel, Apple, and Google often become involved in the class, providing the students with what they consider to be really cool tools to play with. This only adds to the fun for um, everyone involved and not coincidentally increases the employability of the students. It is clear that the course has a tremendous positive transformative impact on everyone involved. One of Dr. Chesney's student nominators wrote that the course, design, the course has greatly increased his awareness of some of the struggles that others deal with every day and that he has benefited by learning how one can design things with a disabled individual in mind so that everyone can use it. Another student nominated, nominator added that Dr. Chesney is one of the engineering professors that every U of M student in his area needs to become acquainted with. with when Dr. Chesney says that he's a woodworker and that he teaches the students to simply build furniture. What he's really saying is that with this furniture, or apps, or projects, or games, he is teaching students, his students, to build a better future for someone else, someone with a disability. It is for this, these reasons and more that I am very proud and honored to have the opportunity to present Dr. David Chesney with the 2018 James T. Neubacher Award. Thank you so much. And now I am in the position of being a computer science professor who needs to get the slides working again. So give me a second here. There is a joke in there somewhere, but we'll, we'll skip that for now. Um, first off, I wanted to say thank you very much to the committee, uh, to Anna and the rest of the committee. I wanted to say um, thank you to the Neubacher family for making this possible. Um, and then I also wanted to say thank you to, to Brad, um, Brad and the, 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 the Brad Nav team. Um, it's interesting to me that just Brad, your, your dedication, your devotion, your patience, and your sense of humor has been so meaningful to to the class and the students that are involved in the class. So 
Um, I appreciate, they deeply appreciate uh, everything that you've contributed to the class, and so this presentation's for you. I want to introduce you to a friend first. Uh, hopefully, by the way, hopefully the title, before it disappeared, hopefully the title got you interested. <laughs> So with that, um, I want to go through each of these. The first three slides cover each of these very important topics, wetland waterfowl, marine mammals, and the equation of life. So first off, let's talk about uh, wetland waterfowl. This is a sandhill crane that lives at Howell Nature Center. And the sandhill crane's name is Fraser. I'll give you a minute on that one. <laughs> Fraser the crane. All right, and now, Fraser the Crane was actually rescued. Um, if, if you look to the right in the picture on um, Fraser's beak, let's see, let's see, right in here. Fraser has the equivalent of a aviary cleft palate. And Fraser was found as a, a little chick in the parking lot of a local mire in Brighton, Michigan. And Fraser, how, how sandhill cranes typically eat is they use their beaks and they poke through the lawn and they'll pull worms or bugs out of the lawn and that's how they eat. Now Fraser can't do that because of the shape of his beak, so he was basically wandering around the parking lot as a chick um, eating the worms that were in the puddles around the parking lot. So he was rescued, he was taken to Howell Nature Center to live the rest of his life at Howell Nature Center. And like a good Seinfeld episode, it all comes together in the end. And we will, we will talk again about Fraser the Crane a little bit later. Um, the next slide that I have, now that we've, we've got this introduction to wetland waterfall, I want to talk a little bit about marine mammals. Now this right here, this is a slide that describes the difference between porpoises and dolphins. And if you look at this, you can see that porpoises, they're a little more rounded. They have a rounder dorsal fin, they have rounder teeth, they have rounder noses. Now we probably, you know, at least my generation, um, which I see a lot of age peers in the group, probably <laughs> relates to dolphins a little bit more because of the TV series Flipper when we were kids, right? But, but um, I want you to pay particular attention of how to tell the difference between dolphins and porpoises. Okay, so porpoises, rounder teeth, rounder fins, um, rounder noses, all right? So, so we've covered wetland waterfowl, we've covered marine mammals. I want to move on now to the equation of life. We're going through this pretty quick. You might think that there's only going to be three slides, but there's going to be significantly more than three slides. So let's move on to the equation of life, and because I like bad puns and graphic puzzles. I want to give you a minute or two to digest this puzzle. So, so take a look at it. Are you ready for me to move on? Yes. All right, so the next slide will give you the word clue. And the word clue is this, is that purpose, <laughs> See what I did there? Yeah. All right, so you got that part, all right? So purpose equals having this plan, embracing chance, and having some kind of underlying principle. Okay, so the, the, the principle was Principal Skinner from The Simpsons, all right? So let's go back, and, and actually I was asked for a summary slide of my presentation. <laughs> And the summary slide for my presentation is this slide right here. So this is the summary slide. So this is the thing for those of you who are graphic thinkers, okay? And now, what I realize is that you cannot propose an equation for life without having significant backup data. And so what I need to do now is I need to come up with some backup data to back this up, okay? And the backup that I have on this, the first case in point, is Forrest Gump. And if you think about this, that, that really what made the story of Forrest Gump interesting, we had Lieutenant Dan. And, and one of the most meaningful scenes from that movie to me was when Lieutenant Dan drags Forrest Gump off of the gurney and drags him down to the floor. And he says, why did you save me? I was supposed to die in warfare. My father died, my grandfather died, my great-grandfather died, you saved me. 
you ruined the plan. You broke the plan, right? So there was this plan, and Lieutenant Dan represented the plan. And then there was Forrest's mother. And what is one of the most famous lines from the movie? Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. All right, so then there's this, this random chance, this, this, this possibility in there that, that everything is random. And the underlying principle, the underlying principle was his love of Jen A, right? That Jenny was always there and Jenny was always a significant part of it. The underlying principle, the thing that kept him going was Jenny. We need more data. So I read, I was reading earlier about James Neubacher. And James Neubacher, um, he worked at the Michigan Daily. He, he worked here at school. He went to work at the Detroit Free Press. Um, while he was working at the Detroit Free Press, he started covering national stories. From covering national stories, he, he had, he developed, he started covering the, the Canadian beats. So he was covering uh, the beat in Canada. In 1980, 1979, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. All right? Um, he returned to Detroit and he started a, um, he started writing articles known as Disabled in Detroit. And these at first had local prominence and then they gained this national prominence. So they became very well known across the country. Um, he had national readership. He fought very, very hard for equal rights and opportunities, accessibility, transportation to facilities, to education. Okay, he was the man. Um, and the, the motto of this award, and I don't know, for those of you who are, who are familiar, or perhaps not familiar, the motto of this award, which is perhaps the best motto for any award on this planet, is raise a little awareness, raise a little hell. Okay? So, so the, this equation, it applies to James Neubacher. Okay? That, that the plan was journalism. The random event, the chance event, was him having multiple sclerosis. All right? It was a chance event. We won't say that that was a blessing. But, but that chance event is what brought us all together here today, okay? And he raised a little awareness, he raised a little hell. Um, some other data points that I wanna bring up. We need more data, so I'll continue with the data. I'll skip that one. Um, me playing, and I don't know if, how, how relevant this is, but me playing, I, during the summer I try to sail as much as possible. From sailing for about you know, 30 years now, I have a reasonable set of skills. Okay, so my plan is to use these skills. The reality is the wind's going to be blowing from different directions, and I never know where I'm going. Okay, so my wife will ask me, where are you going to go sailing today? I'll say, I don't know. Okay, so the, the, the randomness is just where I'm going. And then the, the underlying principle is be safe, have fun. So that's Dave working, or I'm sorry, that's Dave playing. Dave working goes like this, okay? The plan for me is what the registrar says the plan is, okay? I, in fact, I looked up the academic calendar, and, and the academic calendar is set through winter semester 2020. So to a very large degree, I know exactly what my calendar is gonna look like on a weekly basis through May 1st of 2020. I have a very real, idea of what that's going on. Um, the, the randomness in my life are the wonderful individuals that I get to work with, the, the clients that I get to work with, and the cool technology that I get to play with. Okay? I've always been a bright, shiny object person, so having this new, wonderful technology to work with, it just it makes, makes work interesting. And then the underlying principle is do good and do well. And I want to take, uh, on this slide in particular, because I think that's, that's what this, this presentation is about, is the, the type of work that I'm privileged to do here at the University of Michigan. So I want to dig a little bit deeper um, into each of these slides. First off, the courses that I teach. And this is, again, this is the, this is the predictable part of my life. I know what classes I'm going to be teaching each semester. I know the days of the weeks that they're going to be offered. Okay, I know the times of the day. I'm teaching a class this semester. Uh, I'm teaching two classes. One of them is Engine 100, Gaming for the Greater Good. We build computer games um, for, uh, typically it's been for kids on the autism spectrum. Um, the past couple semesters we've worked with um, building computer games for children who are visually impaired. And, and I wanna bring your attention, this is a first semester freshman game. And so students are building computer games here and probably a half 
to two thirds of the class have never programmed before in their lives. So they come to the University of Michigan, they have this introductory class, and they're learning how to build computer games for somebody who's visually impaired or somebody on the autism spectrum. That's the hook. Okay, so, so we bring them in. And then the other class that I'm teaching, and, and I see uh, a couple of my students here, thank you for coming, from EECS 495, it's the senior level capstone course. It's um, software for accessibility. And, and this class is always different, except I know it's gonna be offered on Monday and Wednesday, and this semester it's from noon to 1.30. So it's that, that part, that's part of the plan. And then this class has become popular enough that we have two different sections of it that will be offered during the winter semester. Okay, so, so the plan is, the registrar tells me what my schedule is, I know what my classes are gonna be, that part, that's part of the plan. The randomness now, the, the roll of the dice, is that I never know um, who my client or customer is going to be in the class. We have um, people who are involved in the class actively on an ongoing basis, um, who are the people who come in and say, this is, this is the software, this is the product that we need, this is, this is what we'd like you to develop. Um, it started with a young lady named Grace, probably close to a decade ago, who was involved in the class. She was a young lady, um, fifth grader, um, nonverbal, cerebral palsy in a motorized wheelchair, who came into the classroom and like demanded the attention of these hardened senior level students who are ready to go out into corporate America. And, and you know, she comes into the class and, and everybody just stops. And I thought, this is a beautiful thing. Grace is gonna teach these students more than I ever could in the course of a semester. So it, it was, that's kind of when the magic began. Um, and, and Brad, I, I want you to notice on this slide that cleverly, your, your name is in both blue and red letters. So, so Brad, frankly, was part of the randomness um, of my class that he was, hey, hey, you should talk to Brad. And so I talked with Brad and met Brad, and Brad was involved the first semester, and then Brad was involved the second semester, and now it's been three years, three years every semester. So, so Brad is in transition from being part of the randomness of this class to Brad is being involved in the class on a regular basis. Um, so, so at some point, Brad, you're gonna be all red on this slide, so I hope that's okay. Um, and then just, we've worked with so many wonderful people in this class, and, and, and the best, the class works the best when, when a person like Brad gives his time and comes to the class, is involved, and teaches the students, and works with them, and, you know, tells them what, what he needs and, and what helps him to be a student, okay? Um, we also work with clinicians from CSMOD. And, and a lot of different projects come up from, from CSMOT. When, an interesting project, I talked with um, a doc from the dental school last week, and, and she said that a project that we would like to have you work on is working on desensitizing, helping kids on the autism spectrum desensitize before having any dental work done. And I thought, that is a really interesting project. That is just a phenomenally interesting project of how, how, does, how do you build this project to help somebody who, who doesn't perhaps like the feel of a tag on their shirt to be able to be comfortable when somebody is filling in a filling or, you know, or doing something clean their teeth. So it's like, that's a really interesting project. And so we try to figure out what technology we might use to do that. Um, speaking of technology, we, this is another part of the randomness of the class, is that there's all this wonderful new technology that comes out. And every month, every six months, you know, we, we hear some new technology coming out. We've, Microsoft has been wonderfully generous to all of our efforts. We have these HoloLenses, which are these augmented reality headsets that, um, that you can use to see three-dimensional objects in space and play around with three-dimensional objects in space. Um, Microsoft Connect, where we can do full skeletal tracking. Um, Xbox adaptive game controllers. So Xbox has just come up with this really nice adaptive game controller so that people with different abilities, you can attach any kind of devices so that people can use it. Um, Echo Dot and Google Home. We play, uh, we're playing around a lot with, with voice to text of just how do you record somebody's voice and then how, how do you turn that, that into usable information. So, so in brief, my, how my classes go is, is there's essentially there's a client. Um, First, first day, first day of the semester is that, you know, 
Uh, all of the people who are interested in being involved in the class will come in and talk to our students so that they get an idea of what the projects are. Second day of the class, I bring in one of those coffee carts full of the bright, shiny objects. And I say, and this is your toy box. Okay, what are you going to do this semester? Um, so the, the underlying principle in our class is let us do good and let us do well. All right, so the students, I know they're going to do well. They're graduating from the University of Michigan uh, with computer science degrees. They're going to work at leading companies or they're starting their own companies or they're going to startups and they're going to, they're going to do well. Doing good is a, is a whole other level of motivating them to do the right things while here at the University of Michigan. So once again, the key slide. All right, the, the equation of life is purpose equals having some kind of plan, embracing serendipity, embracing chance, and then having some kind of underlying principle. Let me rewind a little bit now to the beginning. Let me talk about Fraser the Crane a little bit. Now, Fraser the Crane, uh, as I mentioned, lives at Howell Nature Center. On occasion, there will be other baby sandhill cranes found in different places around Brighton where we live. And there'll be, you know, the mom or dad will unfortunately be, have been hit by a car or eaten by a coyote or something like that. So these, these chicks will get rescued and will be taken to the Howell Nature Center. All right. And they have tried putting these baby chicks with other, with other mama sandhill cranes. And the mama sandhill cranes will intentionally starve the babies that aren't theirs. All right, so that their, their own babies have more food and can survive. Okay, so that didn't work. All right, so then what they did is they tried um, having a, sending adults in to feed the babies, but then what happens is the sandhill cranes think that the adults are their parents and will start bonding with the parents and think that they're little human birds instead. So then they sent adults in with hooded sweatshirts and they had them tie up their hooded sweatshirt so that when they went in and, and fed the baby chicks and the baby chicks would think that, you know, wouldn't imprint on, on the adult. Which to me is just a delightful image. I, I just, it's just something that I'd like to see. So clearly you know where this is going now. They found out that Fraser the Crane is, is absolutely the perfect surrogate parent, surrogate father for these baby cranes. All right, so they put the baby cranes in with Frasier. Frasier teaches them how to be these wonderful adult cranes. And then once they are raised to be adult cranes, they let them go in the wild, okay? And Frasier hangs out for the next batch to come in next spring, all right? I think that's a charming story. I love that story. I love Frasier the crane, all right? Um, so in conclusion, Frasier's purpose is to be a good dad. I think my purpose, my professional purpose, is to help build U of M into national expertise and development of accessible software systems. And better yet, to help people along the way. What's your purpose? Thank you. Is there questions and answers, or is uh, there? We can do that if you want to. I, 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 we can certainly open it up for some question and answer. I think that's a great idea. What's your purpose? <laughs> if there are no questions and answers, I'm fine with that. It's just no. Yes, Anna. Okay. okay. I have seen the video tapes. Uh, it might have been a TEDx talk. And I think it was the first person, the one that taught the students. That was a fabulous uh, video tape. Am I remembering correctly? She was very kind of assertive. She was assertive. Um, India. India, right. So I just want to recommend to the audience that they look that up because I think that's a lesson right there. Yeah, I will gladly. The question is about different people who have uh, inspired the class and inspired my students. And there was, um, there was a young lady that we worked with a couple years ago uh, named India who, who was visually impaired. And, and all of my students, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit old school. My students refer to me as Dr. Chesney. And in India, who was a high school sophomore at the time, um, she comes into my office the first time that I ever met her, and she says, now Dave, this is what I want you to do for me. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> and I was smitten. It's like, I will do whatever you want me to do. It's we will, we will get it done. All right. And that was just, just the way India approached life. And that's the way she approached it in the classroom too. And it's like, that's, man, she demanded respect and my students gave it to her right off the bat. Um, and I will, I'll, I'll send you, if you're at all interested, you know, access or a link to that website. There's a lot of great stories from a lot of interesting people that we've worked with over time. Yes, Toby. Do you have any examples of uh, the, tech, the type of technology that has worked for a certain, certain of these students in terms of making their life better? So, um, I can tell technology that has worked that we've had um, a lot of success with are, are tablets. Okay, just because um, user interface issues, you have a bigger screen, and so the touch points, there's a lot of greater touch point. Okay, so that, that's a great possibility. I think one right now that I don't think it was the intended audience for, but I think we're gonna find great usage with is um, any of the voice of text, the Echo Dots and the Google Homes for people who are visually impaired or blind or people who have mobility issues. To, to be able to use voice control to turn the heat up, to turn the lights down, to turn the stereo on, to turn the ceiling fan on. So I think that's possibly, you know, I, I think that that's really going to have some great usage there. Yes? So are, is any of the software available commercially yet? Yes. And, and in fact, one, one of our early projects was an accessibility option um, that's on approximately two billion devices now. Okay, so, so that one, and it was one of those where, where we had success before we were prepared for success. So, so, so I wish we had talked to you know, the Office of Technology Transfer and, and earned a penny on each one of those times that it was an accessibility option. But that being said, it is, it's, it's on all of your phones right now, and it's accessible scanning keyboard. And what it allows for is for somebody with a tremor working on a touch screen, um, that anywhere they touch on the screen, it, it activates the screen. So it, it's kind of hard to explain, but it, it's an accessibility option that's on everybody's cell phone that's, that's current, currently under production. And then we're working on you know, kind of smaller things on an ongoing basis. And I, I work pretty tightly with the Office of Technology Transfer where we probably have somewhere between 40 and 45 new devices, new apps, new possibilities, like every single year. So then at the end of the semesters, you know, we talk to the clinicians, we talk to the clients, try to find out which one has the greatest possibility, and then I, I hire a group of a half dozen or ten interns um, with generous donations from Mott Golf Classic um, to, to hire them to work on these projects for the subsequent summer to continue development of the products. Yes? I have a statement. <laughs> sure. Uh, I attended one of your workshops once, and I remember you, I don't remember their names or where they were from, but I think they were two big deals from industry. And I remember them saying that if you do not know how to work with accessibility, you cannot have a job here. I thought that, you know, was interesting. Uh, yeah, and, and it's interesting. As we become more and more known for our abilities to do this, then companies are looking to us more and more for those students. Um, one of my interns from the summer, th there was a, a, an accessibility expert from Google who came to, to speak to, to the intern group over the summer, and um, they, they hired this person. You know, he had to go through the normal process for hiring, but, but he, he works for Google in accessibility. And I think last night, one of my other students had an interview. Um, she's an IA for the class this semester, just about that. But there, you know, as we become a focal point for our abilities to do this, then companies will look to us as uh, hire to, to hire future employees in this area. Yes? In reflecting on all of the parts of U of M that were here today, what level of engagement, whether it be through Center for Research and Learning and Teaching or other programs, is there engagement in replicating courses like this with other types of like, is there medical school or social worker, LSNA, other models that are building up different skills for students in different types of jobs than computer science, but engaging around accessibility like this? I don't know. That, that's, that's the bottom line. Is that, yes. Yeah, yeah it, it, you know, building up this expertise and then figuring out a way of doing it. A, a um, that this is a 
a somewhat related response, but I'm working on a multidisciplinary design project um, next semester. And this is going to have um, folks from the, the um, School of Theater involved in it. Um, it's going to have the athletic department involved in it. It's going to have um, clinicians and patients at Mott Children's Hospital. And this, this project, and this is one of those, this is the new bright shiny thing, is that we're going to be using mixed reality headsets for kids at Mott Children's Hospital um, who are in long-term care at Mott Children's Hospital to participate in athletic events through virtual reality headsets that are going on down on the athletic campus. You know, so that's one of those where that, that's really pushing new technology and trying to figure out whether we put GoPros on the trombone slides during the halftime show. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, all the technology, and this is where we, we need a lot of help outside of our department. We can figure out, well, some of us can figure out how to turn computers on and stuff. And some of us have difficulty with that still. Um, but, but hopefully, you know, it, that's kind of a, this cross-campus multidisciplinary approach to, to, to trying to solve this problem. Um, that being said, I don't know of, you know, kind of individual initiatives within different departments. Yes? I think what you're doing is absolutely incredible. Oh, thank you. What caused you to get interested in this? Um, multiple random events. You know, I, I mean, really, the random chances of things. Um, years ago, I went on a tour of our local public school system with a woman who was responsible for um, adaptive and assistive technology within our local school system. And you know, I saw some of the devices. In fact, one of the devices that particularly stands out, there was a child who was in an accident and who um, became a quadriplegic as a result of that accident. And this was probably you know, 12, 13 years ago and had um, how we interface with the computer was there was a camera pointed at a dot on his forehead, he had a little bit of neck motion, and then he had a sipper puffer. And so, you know, left mouse, right mouse. And that, that was pretty interesting. Um, so that was one of, the, one of the catalysts. I met with a, a, a gentleman, Joe Kreza, who, who was here, I don't know if he still is, from, through the Mott Golf Classic. It was, and this is, you know, in the random events, I got invited to this meeting in the middle of summer, which meant I had to wear a shirt with a collar, right? So it was like, this is something I did not want to do, but I went to the meeting to, and I met Joe Kreese, and we started talking, and we, you know, we kind of found out we were, we were uh, twin sons of different mothers in terms of the way we approach it. And he works, he's, he's up in um, the, the technology in the, the health systems. So he started introducing me to some doctors and clinicians, and that kind of worked, worked out, you know, part of those types of issues. When I, when I was a, in one final story, when I was a senior in college, and I, I distinctly remember this project, and it, I, I didn't even relate this as being related to this question, so this is getting pretty deep, but when I was, a, I think, a senior in college, I was asked to, while working at GM, there was a really, really good engineer, and, and he developed colon cancer. And I was asked to develop a timer to give him a signal that it was time for him to take his next morphine drip. And so that he could, you know, and he was, he was terminal with this. And, and, you know, we're developing steering knuckles and pistons and all that. And they said, Chesney, will you develop this thing for this, this very excellent engineer? And so I built this thing for him. And I think, you know, it's like one of those things that that plays into it. And I didn't think about that was a, a project that I worked on at the time for someone who I cared about deeply. But I didn't think about that, you know, until lately that, yeah, 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 that was part of it too. So, it, you know, random things. Uh, meeting, meeting Grace, you know, the young lady, there's a, there's a really charming story about meeting Grace. You know, the, the first time I met her, I was introduced by some clinicians of physical medicine and rehabilitation. And, you know, got a phone call, you need to come down and meet Grace. So I came down and met Grace, you know, talked with her, and it's like, yeah, she, she's wonderful. You know, Brad being involved in the classroom. So, so, so what it really means is that you really care about eh, okay. her. <laughs> I would like to believe so. <laughs> Yes. I really applaud your cross-campus efforts. And I think Thank there's you. so much opportunity. I worked in kinesiology. I worked in SI. I think what you're doing in engineering is great. And I think integrating athletics is great. I think there's so much opportunity for cross-campus efforts. Um, I personally have epilepsy. And I developed it late um, stage. And I worked at Ford. And I think integrating um, 
you know, different corporations is great, and I think that they would definitely jump on board in doing that. So I do applaud that. I think we can bring in more schools, and you know, I think that that would be fantastic to do so. And. I think that's great. I, I, I would love to you know, build up any relationships. I, so I work, I'm originally a mechanical engineer, but then um, have background in computer science, and I teach in the computer science department. And, and I'm of the opinion that there are no, there are no interesting single discipline problems. Right, that, that all interesting problems cross disciplines and it's like, well, bring in a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this. And it's like, oh, now this becomes interesting. So, so the idea of bringing in and working across campus, the, the privilege of working with clinicians at Mott Children's Hospital has just been phenomenal. And just as, as an insider tip, too, is that, that if, if anybody has pediatric before their title, they are absolutely wonderful to work with. To a person, it's like it's one of those things where anybody who has pediatric in their name, it's like, okay, yeah, I'll work with you. So, I would agree with that. My sister's a pediatrician. There you go. <laughs> there was a another hand up, or is, no? Yes. I am all ears. I mean, it's, you know, typically I'm, I'm inspired and motivated uh, by, um, by, by clients who come from Mott Children's Hospital, but I listen broadly. As long as, long as I have veto power, I'm, I'm willing to listen. <laughs> a, a, a funny side story, can I tell you a funny side story? Is, is I had, so, so someone said, I, I need to talk with you about a project, and I said, please stop by. And they said, I can't tell you what the idea is over the phone. And so I invited them into my office and they came to tell me what the idea is. And this is always going to be bad. When someone says this, I can't tell you what it is. It's like I, so we closed the door and, and she said, I have this idea for a doggy dating service. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> said, That's not quite what we work on, but, but, but I'll listen, give me your pitch. So. We didn't do it. We didn't do the doggy dating service, so it's just not. <laughs> Any other questions at all? Thank you so much. I deeply appreciate the time. Yeah, if only those uh, video games for the visually impaired were around when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Uh, what, what, a wonderful, what a wonderful day we've had here. I, I really loved the, the uh, poignant uh, symmetry that we saw in, in Dr. Chesney's presentation and uh, Dr. Sellers' introduction to that, the idea of um, who needs whom, who, who benefits from whom. And it turns out we, just, we, we do all benefit from each other. And it, it is really nice to see a, a model and a narrative uh, uh, in, in, uh, in our presence today where we can look to see faculty members like Dr. Chesney at, at, at the university really uh, inspiring the next generation of people who are going to be designing for our world. Uh, if, you, if you take a moment and think about it, most people actually want things to be accessible. They just want it after the fact. Um, and so any opportunity we have to inspire people to think about making devices, technology uh, accessible from the start so that everybody gets to participate early on, it, it, it is a really a wonderful thing. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm exhilarated having been here today, as I hope all of you are, and saddened that we bring it to a close once again. But uh, we will be back next year for the next set of Neubacher Awards. Please, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Anna Schnitzer and the Neubacher Award Committee. It's really wonderful to um, have uh, Andrea Fisher Newman, Regent Andrea Fisher Newman, and uh, uh, former Regent Darlow here. It's, it, it is great to, to send the message that th this is uh, salient for people at the university. I look forward to seeing you all next year. Thank you. Thank you.